the summer hydrangeas, first editions, shrubs and trees, and easy elegance roses. And welcome to another really, really special edition of Garden Gab. Today I am joined by my friend Karen Chapman. She is a garden designer, an author, a speaker, an all around amazing person. I'm so excited. Uh, as you all well know, I bought a new house in this last year and I'm installing the garden. And so we have a lot of deer in the backyard. We are filled with deer and it's all woods behind us. And so today uh, I'm a little bit, uh, I'm gonna spoil all of us and get some special tips from Karen who is the deer resistant design expert. So Karen, welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for joining us. And I'm excited to have a little chat with you today. Oh, it's uh, my pleasure to be here. I wish we could be together in person. You know. It's always fun to hang out, but this is the best we can do right now. It's lovely. Yes, for now. Soon yes, for now. Be able to, I'm excited to come and see your garden finally yes. after yes. all these years. So let's just start and talk about your approach to design. What's your philosophy as you go into a client's landscape, uh, mm -hmm. whether it's a brand new one like I've got back here or an established one that you're working to update? Right. Without question, it is to design foliage first. And that's something I've always done, whether it's designing a small container garden, a patio size garden or acreage like I have. And, and the idea behind that is that flowers are only around for a short period of time and we're all so easily seduced by their pretty colors, but they're just going to be there for maybe a few weeks. And so if we design a garden around that, we're going to be constantly disappointed when those come in and out of bloom. So what I do is create this picture frame, if you like, of gorgeous, colorful leaves, really interesting textures, and then layer into that the flowering plants and maybe artwork, interesting bark and berries, but it always begins foliage first. Well, and you've got a couple of books on the topic. Uh, you've got Gardening with Foliage First and Fine Foliage, both of our other friend, Christina Solowitz. Um, Fabulous, I, uh, as I'm designing my landscape, have been revisiting both of those books. And I think that it's true because as people go to the garden center and start shopping, especially in spring, like right now, you go and you look for the color. And like you said, that doesn't last forever. So yeah. as people are picking shrubs or trees for their landscape, how do you recommend that they take that foliage framework approach? I try and put blinkers on when I go in the nursery. I mean, I used to work in the nursery, so I know how the system works. And we deliberately used to have these beautiful, colorful displays of pansies and primroses at this time of year as you go into the nursery. I put blinkers on and I go right past them and I head out into the nursery where the larger trees and shrubs are and I kind of scan around for those colorful leaves. So at this time of year, you've got, um, certainly in where I am, I know you were saying you're still under snow, Ryan, but where I am, I've got the spirea just coming into color. So you've got that really fun color um, leaf beginning to evolve. Um, barberries, again, for those of us that can grow barberries because it's not invasive where I live, um, that new emerging foliage. Some of the trees like the Katsura have this really cool, interesting early color. So I'm looking for that more than I'm looking for flowers right now when I go into that nursery. And the flowers can be pops of color that we add in. So, right. but they're not, they're not, they don't need to be the star of the show. No, because it's going to be for such a short season. So for example, one of my favorite first edition shrubs, you and I both know, is that summer ruffle hibiscus. And I swear when they come into our local nurseries, <laughs> I just buy them all and I let my favorite clients have them, which is why nobody else can ever find them because I've got them all. <laughs> But the reason I love them is that not only do they have those beautiful kind of semi-double um, orchid lavender type of flower, the leaf is stunning. It's this beautiful variegation, uh, kind of blue green in the center and a creamy white margin. And the form of the tree as well is really suitable for either containers or smaller gardens, because she's not a big girl. She's not one of these eight foot wide madams. Um, she's much more slender, and uh, kind of about three to four foot width in my garden at least. So that you have this beautiful backdrop all the way through, you know, three seasons of these beautiful variegated leaves. And then, oh my gosh, late summer, you suddenly get these flowers as well. And you know what, even the winter silhouette, I think of that one is beautiful because the stems have got that whiteness to them. So they really stand out. Um, amongst the other woody shrubs and trees in the garden. It's, it's a winner. So let's talk a little bit about that, about the color aspect of it. So whether you're looking at variegated leaf or different colors of leaves or stems, how do you go about combining them? 
Right. Well, I start off by trying to find connections. And I think this is a mistake a lot of homeowners kind of fall into. They just grab what appeals to them color wise and they end up with this jelly bean look, you know, one of everything. Um, and your eye is just going, you know, from one to another and doesn't really know how to piece it all together. So I start off by putting together plants that have an association. So if I have, for example, that summer ruffle hibiscus, knowing that it has that blue green in the center, I might partner that say with a blue oat grass, which has a similar shade. It's a different leaf type, but I'm repeating or echoing that blue green color. And then having established a connection, that's when you can have fun and throw in something wild, maybe something orange or something really vivid. It's what I call the spotlight, highlight, limelight approach to design. So I start off with a spotlight plant that's got really cool leaves. That would be the hibiscus. I highlight that color detail. In this case, it would be with the grass. And then the limelight is kind of party time where you can throw in a wild card, maybe a splash of orange. It could be, you know, an orange daisy. It could be an orange urn, but that's when you begin to introduce something new. So then you've got color and then texture. And you've talked a little bit about the different leaf shape, but how do you combine texture in the landscape, um, not only for the visual appeal, but how do you, how you create depth in that space? Right, and creating depth is something, again, which I think many homeowners struggle to kind of understand what we're trying to do there. So let's break that down a little bit. In smaller gardens in particular, we're usually trying to make them feel larger. And one way to do that is to kind of trick the eye, if you like, and make a space feel larger. We do that by using textures such as, again, let's take the example of a very fine leaf grass. You can think of maybe a tall um, panicum, the common name's escaping me, um, but panicum Shenandoah, which is about three, four foot tall, olive green, um, olive green blades with red tips. If you use that in different places and pull the eye through the garden, that's using texture to expand the visual range you've got. And because those um, fine textures move, our eye catches onto the movement. And so that's how we kind of weave our eye through the space. But then having done that, what you get to do is play. Um, maybe add in a lower shrub, which has got a different leaf shape, something like your, um, what is it, love child, the Virginia sweet spire. Yeah which is a nice tidy shrub with a, a more of a mid-sized leaf, which also has that red full color. So you kind of weave that in. Um, if you needed something bright as a focal point in that, you might look perhaps for something gold. Um, again, your limoncello um, barberry is crazy bright, you know, sunglasses gold, but it's got a red margin on. Yeah. You can maybe just have one of those as a focal point. Um, but, you know, with all those hot colors, I might like to temper that down and maybe do a carpet of something silver. Um, I like that really old fashioned Artemisia silver brocade, which is a lovely carpeting plant. Or you could even use one of the little succulents, little stone crop like Capo Blanco um, and just kind of play with it that way. But use the movement and the fine texture to help draw your eye through a space to give depth. So one of the other things that I love about your work is your focus on containers too. So whether it's on your front step or built into the design of the landscape, how do you go about planning for that container garden as well? Well, if the container garden is going to be planted and it's actually within the border rather than just sitting isolated on a, a patio, it's really important to take the context of that container into account. You're not seeing it in isolation. In fact, even if it's by your front door, you're not seeing it in isolation. So I begin to look around and see what color cues I might have. If it is on the front door, I'd be looking to see what color the door is. Maybe the door is red. And so I'd be bringing that red into the foliage and the um, flowers that are within the container. Perhaps I might even use that for the container itself, although I'm more likely to use a contrast within the border, and I have a lot of containers in my borders. Um, again, I'm trying to repeat the color scheme, which is around it. So if I have sunset shades, I'm going to repeat that in the container. And what it does, it makes that container design live large. Suddenly it goes from just being this isolated event to part of a really big dramatic production, and it makes a huge difference. 
So not only in containers, but in the landscape too. Obviously we talked about deer resistance is so important. Yes. And I know you've got a lot of deer where you are just outside, outside Seattle. I've got a lot of deer here in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. So what factors do you keep in mind when you're choosing plants for a deer resistant garden? Right, and there's, there's a few things on this. First of all, to understand deer proof is not a term. Um, you know, there are no plants that will never ever be touched by deer or, you know, we can expect them to never be touched by deer. Deer resistance, there are four shades of gray, not 50, four shades of gray, <laughs> ranging from A, which is seldom damaged at all, to D, which is forget about it, which is like deer caviar. So we're really looking for those plants which are seldom or very rarely damaged. As an example, I have several big groups of spirea in my garden. For four years, the deer walked right past them, didn't even give them a second look. On the fifth year, they obviously figured, well, hang on a minute, if Karen's got so many of these, they've got to be at <laughs> least worth a little nibble here and there. And so they took off a few flowers just off the front face, didn't even stretch the necks to reach the back. And then they didn't touch them again for another four years. So that's an example of a plant which is rarely severely damaged. Doesn't mean it's never gonna have damage. So being aware of that, but then it actually comes back to that idea of designing foliage first and why it's even more important in a deer resistant design. Because if you think about the way the deer eat, they don't burrow their noses into the center of something. They take from the ends of the branches. And guess where the flowering buds are? <laughs> They're right there. So if you filled your garden with shrubs that are just mid-green, you know, middle interest, nothing terribly special, cane shrubs, maybe like a, a mock orange, if all your garden is based on something like that and you're just waiting for these beautiful fragrant blooms in June and then the deer eat them, and they will because they really like those, um, what are you left with? So again, it goes back to that idea of at least two thirds of your plantings have really interesting leaves. So even when the flower buds get nibbled, and um, even if it's only one year in five, you've still got color and interest in that landscape. And that A to D that you're talking about, that's uh, the Rutgers scale. Yeah. Rutgers list, that's right, yes. And it's a super Rutgers list. It is based on the East Coast, so it's not 100% applicable to every area. You're always gonna see some discrepancies. But to me, I think that's the best online resource we have. And you can go on to that and type in the search box, the common or botanical name of hundreds of different plants, and it will generate for you the deer resistance rating. It's a great place to start um, when you're looking for deer resistant plants. Yeah, I think there's a couple of important things there. One is that it can be somewhat regional. Mm -hmm. And two, that there are no bulletproof plants, but you just plan accordingly and have an understanding I know that one part of what I want to do along the back border is plant some of the berry white hydrangea. And I know that the deer are going to just <laughs> gravitate toward it. So I'm like, what can uh -huh. I do behind the fence to keep them a little bit protected? <laughs> yeah. The hydrangeas, it's hard. And you really do have to plan ahead for those. One of the things I've learned to do is to create barriers. And I don't mean fences. Um, but I can use big thorny shrubs, which are less likely to be eaten by the deer. Although my rabbits eat barberries, go figure. But anyway, the rabbits are a whole other story and I'm not writing that book. But I, can't, <laughs> I cannot write that book. But you can do some kind of protection with the bigger shrubs, which are less likely to be eaten. Sometimes we deer, you know, if you can take time to look at which paths the deer typically take, and then avoid putting hydrangeas right in the middle of that path or be able to reroute them. That's going to give you a, a better chance. Let me know how that goes. <laughs> well, I'll keep you posted. All right, I just have one more question. Okay. And for you in the Pacific Northwest, what are two, maybe three of your favorite first edition shrubs that you have in your landscape or you've used with, contain or with your, your customers, either in the landscape or containers other than summer ruffle? <laughs> you know that one. Oh my gosh. There's so many. Well, I'll tell you, one that really blew me away last year was your new seven sunflower, Tian Shen. So much so that I've included it in several designs for clients that are being installed right now. Um, it is stunning. I've long since loved the species, seven sunflower, but it's pretty big. And it's also hard to find um, when it looks nice because it takes a lot of pruning to kind of get into a good shape, just that basic species. Tianshan is a, a more compact form of a stunning tree. Well, kind of a large shrub, small tree. It has 
flowers, fragrant flowers. It has incredibly interesting leaves with gorgeous full color. It has bark. The deer leave it alone. The rabbits leave it alone. It seems to be drought tolerance as well. And I gave it a tough test last year in my garden. So that is my number one and a half because summer ruffle is right up there. Um, <laughs> well, and that's one too that it's, I'm glad we're talking about it because it doesn't look like a whole lot when you buy it in a garden store. Right. So especially if you're out in spring shopping, it's mm -hmm. not super exciting, but once you get it in the ground and it establishes and takes off, it is, yeah. it's one of those that's spectacular. I mean, it's just covered in pollinators. Yes. It's covered in flowers, those red bracts that it's got in fall, yes. that it exfoliating bark. I was just down in our garden here and you know, we're still in winter basically in Minnesota and that exfoliating bark, especially as it grows up, is just fabulous in that. Yeah, no, it, it really is beautiful. And if you can only find it in a small size, you know, put it in a container and put the container in the border. Make a focal point of it that way until it's a little bit larger and you can transplant it because it is going to be a specimen. It's not going to be something you want a whole hedge of. Um, it really deserves to be standing out there on its own. So you could always put it in a container initially. Yeah, it, it's a, a real winner. That was a good one. And then another one, which I was really impressed with last year in particular, was your new dwarf spirea sunspot. Again, to the point that I've just gathered a whole load of them to take to clients later this week. Um, there are so many spirea on the market. I thought I'd be hard to impress with yet another one, but this is truly a dwarf. So it's nice and petite. I even put it in a container. It's great for the front of a border. It has lovely um, sort of bright green golden foliage to it. It kept on blooming all the way through the summer. It just did not stop. Um, and the flower clusters are in proportion to the leaves, which is something which was important to me. So often when I see new varieties of plants that are more compact, somehow they still have huge flowers on and they just look all out of proportion. This one isn't. It's really nicely scaled. So that's a really nice one that you've got there, Ryan. Yeah, it's, it's sometimes challenging with some of those more traditional varieties that we yeah. see that landscapers use in mass that to have a new one come out that gets people excited is, is mm -hmm. exciting for us. <laughs> and uh, we, we were just having this conversation with our, our friend Kelly a couple of weeks ago about Potentilla. And he's like, you guys have yeah. me excited about Potentilla again. What is going on? <laughs> uh, I, yeah, that's <laughs> true. I like it truly yeah. is an improvement on what's in the landscape and can have that consistency and that combination of flower power and foliage color. It, mm -hmm. It's it's exciting to be able to bring those bring those out. Right. And something that doesn't automatically grow to four foot tall, because we don't always want four foot tall spirea, which yep. most of them seem to do. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you for joining us today. I'm hopeful that uh, everyone got a lot of tips for, for their garden planning. Um, I'm excited to get out and see you when we're able and get out and Definitely. see your garden. Um, but thank you so much. Have a great spring. And Thank you. We'll be able to talk with you soon. That um, sounds great. Thank you so much. Take care. Thanks to everyone for tuning in, and we will see you next time on Garden Gab.